Fishendal remembers. The Gaelic Revival, also referred to as the Celtic Twilight, was a variety of movements and trends in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that saw a renewed interest in aspects of Irish culture. Common Luchlas Gael, the Gaelic Athletic Association, or GAA, was founded in 1884 to promote Gaelic games and pastimes. Conry na Gaelige, the Gaelic League, was founded in 1893 to promote the Irish language. In the Glens of Antrim at the turn of the 20th century, a number of enthusiasts were seeking ways to promote Irish language and culture. With the help of Francis Joseph Bigger, a Belfast man, they began to organise Fesh Nanglan, a Glens Festival of Irishness, to be held in Glenariff in 1904. Francis Joseph Bigger had presented the Glenarm Shane O'Neill's hurling team with their first set of jerseys in 1903, and he invited them to play against Carry Fox in the hurling match at the Fesh in Glenariff in 1904. They competed for the Shield of the Heroes and the match was won by Carry Fox. The referee of that hurling match was Dan Dempsey, grandfather of Kieran Dempsey, current chairperson of Glen's Coltis. Roger Casement was one of the umpires. That face had impressive art and craft displays and competitions because the Glens people were well known for their industry. Sir Horace Plunkett, opening the first face in the land, noted that there was such a wide range of industrial effort in the Glens, from boat building to basket making, toy manufacture, boot making and much other useful work. The art and craft section of Facing Land is still impressive to this day, as is another aspect of Irish culture, dancing. This dance is similar to the dances at that very first Glen's Face in 1904. Faisnanglan, the Glen's Face, was held in Cushendall for the first time in 1906. The spot selected for the Face, Leg Green, proved a most suitable one. However, an effort was made by the landlord, Mr Turnley, to prevent the holding of the Face there. Eventually, the Face went ahead in Cushendall that year and was held on what is now the fourth fairway of the Cushendall Golf Course. Roger Casement later wrote, At the Fish, we had a great loyalist attempt to prevent our holding it by the landlord, threatening to boycott his tenant, who was lending the Fish Committee a field in which to hold the sports. The result was that some evil-disposed persons actually dared to print and circulate a ballad ridiculing this gentleman, and several naughty boys sang it among the crowd. I did, uh, and a mainly father had a piece of paper on the very day of that fish, 
And do you know what was on that piece of paper? It was a song. And do you know what the song was about? That? It was about turning, not letting the people into the field for the 1906 fish. The first fish to be held here in Cushendal. Oh, my name is Francis Turney and I come from Cushendal. But in spite of all temptation, I'm no Irish man at all. Oh, I was born in England to the tune of God Save the Queen. And the grass has been turning orange boys wherever I have been. Oh, the green grass will be orange and the river running dry. Before the fish committee meet one as bold as I. I am very bold by pride. Oh, no, I got it. Your father may have bought that piece of paper for sixpence, but I knew for a fact that he sounded later on that evening for half a crown when the supply of porter was running dry. Well, if my father was drinking with your father, and your father was anything like you, then my father was buying it when your old boy was born a down his throat. <laughs> You're not talking to me like that. My father, I say, has the only we half the farm when he's dead. Half the farm? Half of thirteen acres? So that's not much to be looking forward to, Johnny. <laughs> You're right, Dabby It's just enough to keep you here. I do go there sometimes I just feel like going out of this gold for second country. I know what you mean. You feel trapped. You feel like emigrating. Sure I feel the same. Uh, but but I, I like sleeping in my own bed at night, Alec. Here. I didn't know you had ideas in your head to go emigrate. <laughs> Johnny. The only part of Ireland where a man can get ahead is America. The, surely you heard the story of how a, a foot in the turf and Mick Quinn built all the big houses in Cushendall. I did not. Well, uh, young Dolores Kinsella and her young man were being taken to Derry by Mick Quinn, where they had bought and paid for a passage to New York. You know, well, there was a big send off for them here in Cushendall. But by the time they got to Derry, Dolores' young man took cow feet. Well, after an hour or more's discussion, Dolores said there and then that she was going to go to America, even if she had to go on her own. Oh, <laughs> brave girl. So what happened? Well, there was young Mick Quinn, neither packed nor dressed for travel. But he saw an opportunity to improve himself, and he seized it. He said, I go. I mean, perhaps the sight of the beautiful young dark haired Dolores standing there, all so determined, helped him make up his mind. So Dolores, his young man, handed over the ticket and agreed to take the horse and cart back here to Cushion Door. Oh, so, and, and, and did they get married? Well, not at first. Dolores lived with a family and, and Mick he took lodging in another part of the city. He could work in a saloon. Then when they did get married, they had six children and were able to afford to come home here and big, build all those big houses in Bill Street. But, but how do all there, Alec? You said that Mick Quinn and a foot and a turf helped to build the big houses in Cushendall. Well, you see, well, what's that foot and a turf got to do with that? Mick bought the saloon he was working in at a bad price because things weren't going so well. Then he sent home for a foot in the turf, put it in the saloon window, and without a written word of explanation, soon every Irish man in New York would come across to a look at that piece of the old saw. Mick became the bar, and Mick became famous, and he made a fortune. So that's where they get the money from to build all the big houses in the village. Here, listen, Alec. If you want to finish that song about turn, they go ahead. It's all right. Ah, I don't think we'll bother. You know, a lot of the other people say Turnley wasn't the worst of the landlords compared to a few others. Well, I 
Ah, but I heard that he was all right during the fun. Aye. Besides, I think we're holding our man back here. <laughs> Life was very different in Cushendal at the beginning of the 20th century compared with nowadays. Horses were still widely used, along with Cushendal ponies, and this was reflected in the number of blacksmiths' forges throughout the countryside. In 1885, Cushendall Hospital had opened at Number 5 High Street, and in 1896, a new purpose-built hospital was built on the Shore Road by McLaughlin and Harvey at the cost of £2,000. In 1907-1908, a new sewerage system was put in place in Cushendall, and a new water supply followed in 1908-1909. Rowing was an important sport along the Antrim coast in the early 20th century, and very large crowds thronged the shoreline to watch the rowing gigs racing in the regattas. These were hosted by many of the villages along the coast. Glenann School had opened as a purpose-built school in 1899, having moved from the house at the end of Glenann Road, which had been used since the closure of the old schoolhouse further up the Glen. Other schools in the area included Mill Street Boys and Girls Schools, High Street School, Court Hill School, Laid Schoolhouse Gorta Clee and Ballyeman Primary School. A common theme of the early 20th century, and before and since in Ireland, is emigration. The huge exodus from Ireland during and after the famine years of the late 1840s meant that Irish communities were already established in places like North America. As young people heard about, or from, so-and-so who had gone to America, it planted a seed in their minds also. You're going to have a great life. Things are getting better every day. This very day, Push Doll is getting connected to the new clean water pipe. And those dry lavatories will be a thing in the past. And every household could have their own water tap. Yes, it's 1910, and Push Doll has entered the 20th century. Are you talking to that baby again? Jimmy to glory, if it's a boy, he never want to listen to a woman again, and if it's a girl, she thinks she has to talk for Ireland. Nelly, I thought that door was closed. It was, and you're a wise girl, Jane, for you never know what sort of an old Dublin would land in on. Mm -hmm. Now, here we are. Here, Jane. Do you know what Mrs. Macaulay down in the post office calls me when I go down to get my telegraph? She calls me the Nelly Express. And do you know why she calls me the Nelly Express? She says, the Wild West had the Pony Express and Christian Doll has the Nelly Express. It's a bit of a trek, Jim, from the post office all the way up here to Shore Street. Would there be a wee drop of refreshment? A cup of tea in your hand, maybe. Joy to glory as the days of Glen's hospitality gone all together. Oh, you know it's the scullery. But here, go easy, your dad will think I'm helping myself. <laughs> and it's whiskey, and sure I only wanted a drop of buttermilk. Now, here we are. Oh, hold on to... I get on my reading glasses. Now, Mr. James Delarge of Kilnador, Cushendall, applied for a license to keep petrol on his premises. There was no police objection and the application was granted. Jimmy to glory, no police objection. Why, sir dear, hasn't times changed? 
Here, Jane, do you know the blacksmiths in Cushendall? Now, I mean, the one at the top of High Street, the one at the lower end of the bridge. I know where the blacksmiths are, Nelly. And the other one along the road near Fernand's, the hospital. Well, did you know that they had to apply to the police for a licence? No, I didn't know that. And I'm, I'm not altogether sure it's true. Well, it is true. And that goes back to the 98 Rebellion, where the blacksmiths and cushioned all made the pikes for the boys. And you know who told me that? No, who told you that? My mother. And you know who told her? No. Her mother. My granny. Here, Jane. Did I ever tell you about the time my granda had a job up at Parkmore Railway Station, helping the tourists with their luggage? Aye. And think, he was there when the first passenger train pulled into Parkmore. You see, up until then it was only a carried iron ore. Aye. You see, the only thing was, between the midges and the tourists, oh, they annoyed him something terrible. I think, actually, it was more the tourists. So then he said that he preferred just to work in the winter time. I'm sure nobody goes on their holidays in the winter time. So he ended up out of work. Go on, read me something else now. Oh, well, sure, I'll read a bit in a wee while. First, could you not tell me something more about the person all the other day? Here. Did you ever see the tiny, tiny wee furniture they made up at the toy factory and kill the door? I once seen a sofa that way it would fit in the palm of your hand. You see, they make furniture for dolls' houses for the rich people. Aye. I thought I actually might take it up to Tibera and leave it for the wee folk, for it doesn't do you any harm to stay on the right side of them. Barbara McDonald started that factory in 1901, right here in Shore Street. And do you know, Jane, they make all sorts of things. They make galloping horses and, and, and owls and, and pussy cats and even a wind up ostrich. Now go on, read me something else. Hey, hey, have a bit of respect for the written world. Do we have to be through this pantomime every time? I know, you know, the whole of Cushion Doll knows you can't read. I know I can't read, and I know the whole of Cushion Doll knows I can't read, and I can't write either. You see, my mummy died when our Kathleen was born, so like I was the oldest in the family, so I had to stay at home and mind the house. You see, when you're having your way, you'll have that lovely wee nurse Kirk. You'll have Major McDonald, and you'll have Dr. Ikean, and you'll have the whole cottage hospital if you need it. Oh, no, Nelly, that was all kind of me, and I'm sorry. No. Never worry yourself, sir. I'm only a softer now, fool. Anyway, go on, read me something else. You won't listen to this. Captain J. McAllister from Tappanahone, Cushendall, has merged his liquor. Lichter, Lichterage, Lichterage Company, with the Greenpoint Company, and now has over 100 boats operating in New York Harbour. Oh, now, you know, I read, and that's a grand thing for me to be able to do, and you can't, and, and it's through no fault of your own. But you see, now, the history that your grandmother and your mother has passed down to you, well, that's wonderful. It's people like your grandmother and you, Nelly, that have kept our history for us in times when nobody could read or write. It's people like you and your grandmother that are able to remind us and tell us who we are. Thank you, Jane. But here, I have to go now. Well, go back tomorrow, Nelly. And maybe you'll tell me a wee bit more about pushing all the old days and I can tell my children. I'll do that. And you know what, Jane? I'll bring a drop of buttermilk with me. That would be lovely. And here now, the front door will be open.
My dear big sister Mary, I hope this letter finds you and my dear brother-in-law James in good health. Mary is only two years older than me, but to listen to her you'd think she was my granny. My dearest little sister Jane, I write you a few lines to let you know I am well and hope to find you the same. I came to New York from Glenan, coming on 20 years next June. Yeah, it was hard leaving home, more so leaving my dear little sister Jane. She was such a sweet child. I understand your daughter, my niece Jeannie, wishes to come here to me in New York. Jeannie has been living out at home in Glenan. She was taking care of Dana until his passing last winter. I think she misses him terribly and is herself full of melancholy. Get her home, let her have a rest and tell her not to worry. I'm trying to lift her spirits. Make her two nice calico dresses. My beloved older sister believes that every calamity that life brings forth can be solved by either the purchase or the making of dresses. I have reared three children. So please don't tell me not to uh, have her look look in shadow. Now when she comes to me, tell her to bring as many dark dresses as she owns and purchase her two nice white aprons from the drapers in the village. Why two white aprons? I will attempt to get her along with me into service. She has no experience to be placed in service. My dearest little sister, do trust your elder. Jeannie has been living out at home looking after Dad. I expect her to be a little experienced. My beloved elder sister, well, life in New York must be very easy. Here in Pushadol, a person cannot just purchase two white aprons and the material for two calico dresses on a whim, even an older sister's whim. Dearest Jane, I can see that I may have caused you to become a little friend. I am sending a pound to help to get Jeannie ready to come here. Thank you, dear sister. We should have Jeannie ready to go to you by the end of the summer. By the way, when was it ever known for anyone from Glen Allen to become a thran? When Jane goes into one of her thran moods, the best thing to do is ignore it. Oh no, you mustn't wait. The best of the upper class families go to the country around the 1st of May. You must get Jeannie here as soon as you can. Dear Mary, our endeavours for Jeannie to take passage to you are almost complete. Only today I bought a travelling trunk at a very reasonable price and there's more than enough space for Jeannie to pack her comfortable underclothes. Don't be sending her over with one of those big Irish chests, for we're sick looking at them every day. Those Irish chests have made us the laughing stock from Ellis Island to Brooklyn. Jane, get Jeannie a trunk, a nice little one, and don't let her bring any old underclothes. Get her nice new ones. I'll send a pound. It isn't easy here in New York, but I haven't forgotten how hard times are at home. Now, tell Jeannie to be careful when she's coming on the boat. Tell her to keep her eyes and ears opened and be careful who she speaks to. Dear Mary, the time has come and with all the preparations and excitement, it's only dawn on me now that when Jeannie boards the lighter at Vinegar Point, I will never see my lovely daughter again. Will this curse of emigration ever leave our land? Dear Jane, I am no longer going to call you my little sister, although I love you very much, for Jeannie is going to be my little sister. And God help her, for we both know how that goes. Take care, and there is no need to worry, for an ocean could not break the bond between sisters. All oh, my love, Jane. We don't have much opportunity nowadays to hear from someone who emigrated to America in the early 20th century. 
However, our researchers in North America learned of a Kushindal woman, Harriet DeLarge, who was born in 1911 in Tavanadrissa in Glenan and emigrated to America in 1929 at the age of 18. We believe she is the oldest person alive who was born in the Glens. We managed to get a very brief word with her just after her 105th birthday. Yes, 105 years old. Understandably, she was very tired and so the interview was kept very brief. Well, who was your teacher then in the Glen Ann oh, School? Oh, we had, uh, we didn't, we had a couple of teachers, one that, you know, left and then another one came. And then we had a woman teaching who was in lower classes. Right. The man was teaching the higher classes. And what was her name? What was his name? Yeah. The last name that came was McLaughlin. The one before that I don't remember. But. But, well, All right, when you first come here, you came to the United States because you said my mother, Maggie, right. was yes. writing and telling your father and that job, some... Jobs were scarce. Yes, jobs and, were scarce in the 1920s, yes? And everywhere you went were not hiring. Right, right. Which but you and Helen come over, higher. right? Uh, you and Helen came to visit my mother in the States? Yeah. Well, I stayed with her. Yes, yeah, Until I got a yeah, job. Yeah. Huh? They, they stayed with her, my mother. Yeah. Yeah. But they I stayed. I didn't stay anymore. Well, yeah, well, they went back. They went back home and they stayed Helen for two years. Back. Did she? No, my brother and the kitty. kitty. My brother didn't come here to stay. Yeah. Came out to see my, my yeah. sisters. Her, her brothers. And you didn't come here to stay. Visitor. Yeah, John, come with Kitty. Kitty, yes. yes. In this Glenan School photograph, Harriet is circled in the front row. It's important to let you know that you don't have to go to North America to meet someone who was living in the Glens 100 years ago and is still to the fore. In Cushendall, Mrs. Mary Macaulay is alive and well at the age of 102. Mary was born in Glendon, and her family name was McNeil before she was married. In this Glendon school photograph, Mary is circled in the middle row. Mary is a regular attender at local whist drives and won the top prize at the Cushendall Whist Drive at the beginning of November 2016. Up until the 19th century, the Glens had been largely Gaelic-speaking. In the year 1900, Joseph Duffy, headmaster of Knocknacarry National School, attributed the decline of the Irish language in the Glens mainly to two factors. The first was the building of the Glendon Viaduct in the 1830s. This was a lengthy project, lasting a couple of years, introduced large numbers of English-speaking workers into the area. To get one of the lucrative jobs on the project, you had to be able to speak English. The second factor was the hostile attitude of the Catholic clergy to Gaelic, following the establishment of Irish medium Bible schools in the area by the Presbyterian Church. The Irish language is a great store of folklore and songs. The founder of the Irish Folklore Commission, James Hamilton de Largie, or Seamus U de Largie, was born in Cushendall in 1899 in de Largie's Hotel, where the Glens Fold is now. The song Arda Cuan is a famous Gaelic song from the Glens. It was written by Cushendon man Sean McAmbrose and tells the story of someone who is thinking of emigrating to Scotland and is dreaming, or perhaps daydreaming, of what it would be like to be over there in the Mull of Kintyre looking back at the glens, thinking of all the things he used to do at home, like the hurling match on Cushendun Beach at Christmas time. Egomain er in tra wan is machaman buan ni magornlium. Finally, he decides that he'll live out the rest of his days in Ireland. Is go wahin boss in Yaren.
Hurling is a popular sport in the glens. It has been played, of course, for centuries as Shinny or Kamaniacht in Gaelic. The song Arda Huan and its line Agamain Nir and Trawan predates the foundation of Common Lochless Gael or the GAA in eighteen and eighty four. It was in the early years of the twentieth century that the organization of Gaelic games in the glens under the auspices of the GAA started to become a reality. Carrie Fox and Shane O'Neill's Glen Arm led the way, and their hurling at the first facing land in 1904 provided a great showpiece to get other communities in the Glens thinking how they might organise themselves to be part of this great movement. Of course, inter-club and intra-club rivalry has always been part of the GAA. Ah, I see you managed to get there, boy, to give you the price to go to the match today. Ah, indeed. I was touch and go for a while. I never heard as much moaning and groaning in all my life. And the number of instructions you gave me. Enough to put your head away. I swear to God, it'd get worse. Aye, but still, he gave it to me. Ah, I suppose. I suppose nothing about it. It's a long job to go on to play those shit and boys. You have a grand set of ways. Well, it looks like Shank's mare for me. Hey, where's your own bone shake? Ah, jeez. Sure didn't I ride her off last week and home from playing that game tearing over. It's bad enough we lost a game by a point. But there I was, flying down the arm. And Doris out in my cow appeared out of nowhere in the middle of the road. Ah, it's like a piece of action. <laughs> Luckily for me, I'm still in one piece, but uh, I'll take a better man than me to put the bike back together again. Hi, but it's a long walk to Glenarm. What? Me arse. I'd be blowing myself on that big crossbar of yours. You'd pedal for all your fat, and we'll be at Glenarm before you can wipe the sweat of your brow. Well, I think if that's the case, then you can spell me, and we'll both end up in phase two and have a word about the sweat. Ha <laughs> ha, no problem. <laughs> I always said the Glenarm men were much tighter than them from Bali even. I feel like. I'll pedal the whole way to learn our cell. And what's more, I'll still play better than you. <laughs> I think you need to sit down and take a breather, or you may actually start to believe that shit that you're talking about. <laughs> anyway, where's the rest? Sure, weren't they all supposed to go to first mass and meet at the corner for a level? And I seen a whole pile of them 
get into the second house. And none of them looking too fresh either. Hmm. A few too many beer in the supper last night. Oh, well, I'm glad it's only 17 this day now. I'm not 21 this day like it was in the olden days. Ah, you're right there, Pat. Do you remember whenever Father George got this organized back in 1906? She's been hers from every town land in the parish. Here, we had a damn good minor team too. Well, oh, I. And that's when we used to play our matches down along the river. What was it, the Glens? I heard a rumour they were uh, talking about building a golf course there in the future. She's oh, well, the hard times it's had, and the number of boys immigrating. I'm telling you, we'll be struggling to field a team. Here, we maybe have to pick up the golf ourselves. Here, the door's not going to be making a 15 aside. You know, Pop, that's the first bit of sense you've made all day. Fifteen of is not a bad idea. Here, but I'm not sure if all the team will go for it. Like, the Collins are very strong. They've got a pile of players. They love more on the boat. Oof. Talk about rowing the boat. I hear they're the rowing the luck. Did you come back to the beat of last Sunday? What was wrong with them? Beat the early O's by a single point, not a big enough margin. No, apparently some of their players weren't happy about getting the game. So five of them have transferred to Christian Dunn. Oh, Pat, you had the go and spoil it. First you tell me there's a round in the camp, and I'm thinking we beat them on the return match later on in the year. And now you're telling me that five of their players have went and transferred to Christian Dunn, who we play next. Well, oh, things have gone from bad to worse. Aye, and I believe in mighty handy players they are. The three Collie brothers are coming, and you know how good they are, Jim. Ah, oh, don't tell me any more, Pat. Them up for strong and now they're going to be even stronger. I can see another defeat in the horizon. And the worst of it, we're not here then for over six months. If you're at the fair, or at a sheep sale, or even down the pub for a quiet pint, the next thing you'll see is one of the wee dumb men sliding up in beside you. Look, and all you'll hear then, what happened cushioned all in the big hurling match during the summer? Huh? The very thought of it had me in bad form. Ah! Tell you, body when men go. Beat before you've even played the game. Ha! <laughs> you wouldn't hear us on all men talk like that. Listening to you, Pat, is as bad as listening to the cushion dumb men after they won the North Upham Championship in 08. <laughs> Settle down, Jim. Sure. You know what the famous poem says? Into the land and round about. A team of herders was rigged out. It caused a boom in the herding trade. A whole new set of specs was made. Your Paddy Randy and Dan Stan, who ate Billy from Sweet Glenan, John Lynn from Trumra Bay, and Charlie Ten Boots from Far Away. <laughs> and I bet you Charlie Ten Boots from Far Away was the only herder he's had. I'm telling you, it must be near only your cronies wrote that poem. Here, speaking of specs, where do you get that fine piece of ash out of you have in your hand? Ah, you know way down and you cycled round Ireland last year? Ah, indeed. Only a school teacher and a hotel owner with enough time in their hands to go off gallivanting around Ireland for a full summer. I'm telling you, some boys get her hand in. Aye, sure enough, teachers whole lives of all in. Anyway, that's not the point. On their travels, they were in for the And they saw a group of herders playing. And they noticed. The Kilkenny men were using a different designer stick. But, to cut the long story short, sure after the game, did one of the Kilkenny men get a pure stick? I'm telling you, if that human fell into the tide, he'd come out dry. Aye. Uh, and once I've seen her, oh, I had a few hits with her. Oh, fell in love with her straight away. So I took her down to Jimmy McAllister and Glenan. And after he made a template of her, I got him to make me a couple of ones. Hey, give us a look at it there. Jesus. Jeez, that's a fine bit of ice there, Pat. Hey, I'll maybe be paying a visit to Jimmy himself. Da! Admit it, Jim. Whether it's making the sticks or playing the game, you just can't beat the men from the land. Ha <laughs> ha, I suppose. I walk into that one for a fair play. Sean, oh, what are you two boys up to? <laughs> what do you mean what are our two boys up to? Sure, my plan's on arm. I'm on face train today. Well, if you are, you're playing your own. But she's not here. Here what? 
There's a road regatta all up the face there and half the alarm team to go. So the match is off. Where did you hear that? I'm sure I've been told Thursday night Jim, but you two wouldn't know because you weren't there. Dad, Jesus, I was away up foot and turf on Thursday. Oh, I'm out of date. Well, we move on from here now. <laughs> The Glens has had a long tradition of seafaring. At one time, Glenann was nicknamed the Glen of the Captains. Such was the success of its seafarers in rising to positions of authority and responsibility. This was no accident, because Mr. McNamee, the principal of Glenann School from 1899 to 1919, included navigation as a subject on his national school curriculum. Unfortunately, while Glen's people had many successes in their lives as sailors, there were also tragedies. Perhaps the greatest seafaring tragedy for the Glen's area during the First World War was the loss of the Robertson steamship, the Gem, off Scarborough on Christmas Day, 1914. Captain James McKeegan, aged 65, from Fal McCrilly, Glenan had been captain of the GEM since 1895. It's over 100 years since I walked the streets of Christian Law. And if you lived 100 years ago, 100 years was a long time. But yet, I can tell you that from this side of the light, 100 years is but a blink of an eye. I have come here tonight because I am tasked with telling the story of the men from around Christian Doll who, like myself, never came home from the sea because of what we knew as the Great War and what you know as the First World War. You know the gem, my gem, and how she was lost on Christmas night 1914, and how Hugh McKeegan, James McNaughton, and myself along with seven other shipmates, were lost off Scarborough. James McNaughton was 22 and from Libertalish. He was an able-bodied sailor. His parents were Archie and Mary McNaughton. Mary was a McKeegan. But you know all this. You don't need me to tell you that Hugh's mother was my younger sister, Margaret and that Hugh was 27, and the gems cook and stew. You know and remember the gem, for we have seen the memorial and the anchor that you have placed on the green along the shore in the town land of Alaska, and for that we thank you. But we in the gem, and James McCambridge, to come home to Christian Doll and tell our story, there were others who were not so fortunate. The next ship to be lost to the local man was sunk on the 13th of March 1915. That was the SS Hartley. It was sunk by a U boat, U 27. The Hartley was just off the County Down coast near South Rock, a place which any sailors among you would know well. The Hartdale had 11 crew. They all made it to the boats and were picked up. All that is but two. One of those two was Alec McKeegan from Tavna. Alec was an ordinary seaman and just 24 years old. He was one of nine children, the son of John and Mary McKeegan. And as you would expect, the loss of Alec hit the family, Kavna Han, and Cushing Old Hall. The bad days for the sailors from Cushing Doll and the surrounding glens began with the sinking of the gem at the end of 1914, and the sinking of the Hartdale in the spring of 1915 was a warning that things were not about to get any better. The SS Southport, like the Gem, had a mine in the North Sea. It was the 25th of February, 1916. 
and the South Forth was just off Great Yarmouth. There was 13 crew and 11 made it to the boats and two went down. Second engineer John Murray was at his post in the engine room and never had a chance. John was 38, the son of Patrick and Rose Murray. He was born in Red Bay and lived in Waterford. John was a good ship's officer and well known and respected by any man who sailed with. It was the night of the 18th of December 1916 when the captain of U boat U80 spotted the SS Opal through his periscope. The SS Opal, like the JM, was a Robertson steamship. The Opal was bound for Belfast and had just passed the Isle of Man. The captain of U80 ordered the U boat to surface. There was no need to waste that precious torpedo on an unarmed merchant ship. The only thing an unarmed merchant ship could do to a U boat was ram it. So, the captains of U boats always ordered to the surface to the beam of their target. That way, there was no danger of the U boat being rammed, and it also gave the deck colours a much easier target. It really was all too easy. Earlier in the war, a decent U-boat captain would have given a ship's crew time to get to their boats and pull away before the ship was shelled. But by December 1916, that would have been a dangerous tactic to employ on the Irish Sea. Archie MacDonald lived in Ballabrack, but it was through his mother that he was related to myself. Paddy MacDonald was Archie's father, and his mother was Ellen McKeegan, my sister. I sometimes think that it was a mercy that they had both passed beyond the lake before Archie was lost. Looking around, I see a lot of McKeegan's, McDonald's, Murray's and McNaughton's. And well, from time to time, me and the boys look at them just to see how you're getting on and you're doing grand. Good luck. You'll be seeing but hopefully not too soon. 1914 was a big year for Cushendall. Considerable effort within and beyond the community led to the building of an impressive new chapel. Among the fundraising ideas was the publication of a booklet called Words of Wisdom. Local people were encouraged to provide their favourite words of wisdom and for a small fee, these would be included in a booklet. Then, for a larger fee, the complete booklet was sold back to the people who had contributed to it, and also to other people. This proved to be a very effective fundraiser, and was just one of many. An example of how the parish priest had galvanised the people into a sense of common purpose. My dear people, we gathered here for always remember this 20th day of August 1914. For on this day we have dedicated and blessed our new church, the Church of the Blessed Virgin Mary, here in the parish of Cushendall. And I thank those of you who met the special train that left Belfast this morning and ferry people from there, from Patmore Station to here in Cushendon. That was a wonderful neighbourly and Christian act. Then again, you are wonderful neighbours and true Christians. I have asked the doors of the church to be left open so that the people who could not fit inside may at least hear Mass and listen to me thanking a few people. Firstly, Bishop Patrick McKenna, who stepped in at short notice after the sudden death of her own dear Bishop Toole. Indeed, 
It is a truly sad loss as Bishop to himself donated the side altar of Our Lady of Lourdes. I also have to thank Mr. Joseph Devon MP for helping to assemble the committees and in Belfast to raise funds for a new church. As many of you know, a new church has been built at Stone Quarry locally. But what you possibly don't know is the cost of this building was a total of £9,000. My dear, beautiful, generous people, I can tell you that because of you and our friends in Lock Hill, Carnock and Belfast, we have raised £8,500 and have virtually cleared our debt. It was the garden fest, the sale of works, and the fed in Celtic Park and the generosity of many friends both here and across the ocean. We here in the parish of Christendall will always remember this month, August 1914, for the opening of our new church. But unfortunately, there are other events taking place in Europe. Unpleasant events. Cast your eyes to the bare walls of our new church. The stations of the cross, which should have adorned these walls, are still in the area where they have been made. At this very moment, people are suffering in the conflict which I fear which will become a lot worse before it's over. This very morning, Rector Millet, James Mullern of Lake Parish congratulated me on the opening of our new church. And we both agreed that all the Christians of Christian Doll should offer up a prayer for those suffering on the continent and a swift end to this terrible war. My dear people, I have just been given a note just before I came up here to speak to you and the news is of today's collection and has been counted and its total is £944. My dear people, your generosity today, as it is every day, is exceptional. My dear people, join me in the final blessing, and I think we will have it in our native tongue. In Adam and Adam, Agus and Rick, Agus and Spirit, Nave, Amen. However, as Father McCartan and the people of the Glens were seeing the plans for the new chapel in Cushendall come to fruition, the whole world was rocked with the news of the outbreak of the First World War on the 28th of July 1914. This brought a strange dilemma for people in the Glens. On the one hand, the British cause of the liberation of small nations in Europe found resonance with Irish nationalists at home. On the other, it was difficult to consider fighting for the British cause at a time when growing nationalism across Ireland sought freedom from British rule. When leading Irish nationalist John Redmond advised nationalists to back Britain in its time of need by signing up to fight on its behalf, he stated his belief that such generosity of spirit would be rewarded by the granting of home rule to Ireland after the war. And sure, everyone said it would all be over before Christmas 1914. And so we have patriotism towards Ireland and Britain causing confusion in the Glens. Well, Johnny, happy new year to you. Oh, hi, Alex. And a happy 1915 to you too, if that's at all possible. Oh. I know what you mean. Should have they tell everyone the war would be over by Christmas? Now that's come and gone. Yeah, and by what's in the paper here, things are only set to get worse. They're looking for more volunteers, or there's trouble conscription. So, Johnny, what about you? <laughs> Will you be joining up then? Well, you know, Alex, I was contemplating it, but I suppose you have to do your bit. 
Yeah. Who's your bit going to be for? Nah, well you see now, Alec, that's the thing. There's that many armies and causes in this country to do your bit for. It's hard to know which one to choose. What about king and country? Oh, Mary, Alec. I like to sleep in my own bed at night. I don't think they'd allow me to go home from France every night. And besides, there are those who wouldn't like the idea of me going off to fight for the English king. What are you talking about, man? Sure isn't the great patriot John Evan himself encouraging Irish men to go off and fight for the king? He is! It's true. Ah, now is that true, Alec? It is true. John Revan is asking Irish men to go and fight for the English king, and in return, England will give home rule to Ireland. So an Irish man is asking Irish men to go and fight for the English king for Ireland. They are. Here, yeah, what about the, the IR? The IRB, are they fighting for Ireland? Of course they're fighting for Ireland. <laughs> but not for the English King. No, they're fighting against the English King for Ireland. Listen up here, Johnny Boy. And I don't think this so simple that even you will understand. Irish men are fighting for home rule and for the English king for Ireland. There are other Irish men who want more than home rule who are fighting against the English king for Ireland. There are other, other Irish men under the guidance of Sir Edward Carson who are fighting for the English king and against home rule for Ireland. Any questions? Yes, Alec! Who is the king you fighting for? Belgium. Yes. And remember that there are more armies, as many armies here in Ireland as there are in France. And remember, your country needs you. Yes, you. You look like a fine, strapping young buck. Why not join one of the many armies we have here in Ireland in 1915? By the right, quick march! Many prominent people visited the Glens in the early 20th century. Sir Roger Casement was one of the most famous nationally and internationally. Having been knighted by Britain for his work in exposing atrocities in the Belgian Congo, he could have dined out on that title and made a comfortable life for himself. However, he was an ardent Irish nationalist and devoted himself directly to that cause. One of his close friends, Miss Ada McNeil from Cushendun, gives us particular insights into his personality and their friendship. I first met Roger when I was 24 and he was 20. 21. I remember the meeting distinctly. Our cousin Charlotte had married Mr. Casement, uncle to Roger, and when anything took me over to Valley Castle, I always called with her. Roger was there on one such visit. He was tall and slight and, and handsome. I think he was just home from Africa, and we talked long into the afternoon. After this, whenever Roger was in Valley Castle, he always came over to see us. We were both great walkers, and as we strolled out over the hills and up the glen, we discovered we could talk without stopping about Ireland. This was a great joy to me, being from the Unionist setting. Roger had the history of Ireland at his fingertips. And when I criticised the Irish side, he would easily refute my arguments. 
I learned a lot like this until it became a passion for me to see Ireland free. In 1904, the first Glen's fish was due to take place in Glenariff, and Roger's name was on the committee representing Glenchesk, and we worked hard for it together. By now, a spirit was awakening in Ireland. Even in the sleepy glens, people were turning out in big numbers to meetings and attending committees. Often Roger and I discussed Ireland's forthcoming struggle. He would challenge my view on the need for bloodshed and vengeance, for he hated cruelty and war. Oh, he must have witnessed tremendous suffering in Africa. He left the glens for a greater stage in Peru, and when he returned he appeared strained and ill through his efforts there. We met several times on my return from India in 1912, for by now he was up to his neck in the fight. 1913, he came to Cushendown to speak at Shane O'Neill's cairn and warned that war was coming. June 1914, I remember picking my favourite rose for him in the garden when he said goodbye. I saw him again in Brixton Prison in 1916. Today, I took out of my dressing case his goodbye letter to me, written from Pentonville. The letter had lain there, carefully hidden, for 12 years. The Great War in Europe must have seemed abstract and exciting when the young and not-so-young men were signing up. And as Irish patriots, they were being told by their leaders that support for Britain now would be rewarded with home rule for Ireland after the war. However, the reality of war struck home as local families were numbed by the dreaded telegram. Very sorry to have to inform you that your beloved son was tragically killed in action. For families in the Glens, the loss of a son, brother or husband fighting for Britain in the First World War was a bereavement with particular difficulties. Not only did the families not get a body home to bury, but after 1916, when, in the words of W.B. Yeats, things changed, changed utterly, they didn't really get the opportunity to grieve publicly for their loss. While we have tried to ensure that we've included everyone who should be included on this list, we cannot be completely sure that that is the case. This is probably the first time that the names of the Glens men who died fighting for British forces in the First World War have been acknowledged publicly by our community. to do me for a lifetime. Oh, boys. Look oh, here. Is that Johnny McElroy, the blacksmith? Boys and dear. That's the Colleen Bone. I remember that. Oh, that must be, what, about ten years ago? Thirteen years ago. The Cushendall Dramatic Club put the Colleen Bone on here in the village. They did it from the back. 
the cast of The Calling Ball, the 27th and the 28th of December, 1909. Oh, for goodness sake. Oh, and look, there's Jimmy McElroy and Arthur McAllister, John McMullen, Mary McKeegan. Oh, and John McCollum, Sarah McAteer, John McCauley, Mrs. Stone, oh, and there's Katie Hamill, oh, and there's Alec O'Hara, and Mary McMullen. In fact, the whole, the whole village seems to be in it. And the reading rooms above McAllister's show. I think I would have been a good actor. Really, now, you, an actor. You've many talents, but I wouldn't count acting among them. Now, there, in that picture, the likes of Dan Dunn and McAllister, now there was an actor. Oh, he could do sad. And they say nobody could do happy like Katie McElroy. And when Arthur Harvey did angry, they said he actually scared people. And when Bella McElroy did passionate, they said Father Conway nearly bothered for coming to the chapel. What are you doing? Are you taking a turn or something? I was aching. I was giving a aching. Oh, it takes more than pulling a few funny faces to be an actor. I was at a wedding here one time late at the Temperance Hotel, and all you could get to drink out of was tea, apple juice, or buttermilk. It was the most unusual wedding ever I was at. Here, Jane, did I ever tell you that I was at a wedding in Dublin on Easter Monday in 1916? You never said, Nelly. Did you see the GPO or any fight now? Well, you see, my sister's husband's nephew's cousin's. Uh, Anyway, my sister, she came down with something and she wasn't able to go. My sister doesn't touch a drop. You know, that is a very unnatural way to live. Right, so you have to go to represent the Glen side of the family. Yes. And then on Easter Sunday, they had a bit of a do. Oh, it was a killer. Oh, no, Jane. Socialising. That's what it's called in the city. Socialising. So then on Easter Monday, well, I had a bit of a, a hangover, a bit of a headache. So I thought I'll go for a walk and take in the nice fresh lippy air and see if I could get rid of my headache. You see, Jim, I have never been in a big city before. And people told me that it could be very noisy and very thrilling. So when I started to see glass on the road and furniture, and here shooting and shelling, says I to myself, cities is a lot noisier and more through other than I was ever led to believe. You heard the shooting and shelling? Well, I went a wee bit further closer to the centre of the city, and the next thing I started to see all these posters on all the walls, and then Jim, I saw this woman standing at the far side of the street, with a crowd of people around her, and she had a uniform on her, and a holster. And there she was, reading from one of the posters. Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God, and the dead generations from which they get their notion of nationhood. Irish men and Irish women, right there in broad daylight, an Irish woman with a gun in her holster, proclaiming to everybody that Irish men and Irish women were equal. Well, that there when you saw was history now. I mean, we know we're the equal to any man. But to hear that being read out by a woman in the capital city of your own country, well, that is history. Well, now, like, I wasn't there whenever the British sent the gun boat up the Liffey and blew the place to smithereens. And I wasn't there when they marched those men through the city and off to Wales to jail. And I know, Jane, that a lot of people jeered but I would like to think that I would have cheered. 
I remember here in Christian Doll when the news came through that they'd shot those men. That was the day that people changed. That's when Ireland changed. At first, what happened in Dublin in 19 and 16 seemed very far away from Christian Doll. But sure, neither time nor distance could protect us. The tales of death and destruction on mainland Europe and in Dublin were horrific, but it didn't stop there. Unfortunately, the killing came to the Glens in 1922. With the killing of Charlie McAllister and Pat McVeigh in Glenariff, and the killing of John Gore, John Hill and James McAllister in Shore Street in Cushendall. It's a sad journey we've been on in Cushendall this past 10 years. Too many mothers have lost their darling boys and we live on in pain and suffering. A light has gone out and a cold wind reminds us of our lost futures, all gone. And we try not to think of the loneliness of their last moments, whether on land or sea, far away or right close by. Now left behind, the women would gather to pay respects, carrying in their hearts the memory of their dead darling sons, some resting in the graveyards of the churches where they were christened, and some not. Mother Mary, have pity on the mothers here in this small parish. Give them the strength to carry on. Mary, Queen of the Gael, pray for us. But gradually life returned to a greater sense of normality and the people of the Glens found time and created opportunities to get together for evenings of sharing stories, singing and dancing. Dancing in particular has always been very popular in the Glens. Shin eh, shin and mage, to sue lugging or win to salt us in DVD shop. Slan, 